Now we are going to have our next presenter from Canalix. Please allow me to share the biography of Mr. Yeturatha. Mr. Yeturatha is an information security professional with over 15 years of industry experience. He spent over five years as software engineer in different industries such as independent software vendor, facility management, and healthcare. During his corporate career, he worked in one of the top tier international financial institutions as information security specialist. He led a team of security specialists in the global security operation team, analyzing security vulnerability in infrastructure, web and mobile applications. I would like to invite Mr. Yeturatha to provide his sharing of cyber defense and information security in MFIs. Hi, uh, can you see my screen share? And uh, hear me properly? Just a sound check. Oh. All right, uh, I think uh, I'll just use the uh, uh, English as a primary, primary language for the presentations. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here. And uh, thank you. Thanks. This uh, works for uh, being part of this uh, event. Uh, today, I'd like to discuss a bit about how and why for the cyber defense in, uh, in the MFIs. So uh, just a quick introduction. So I started a firm called uh, Kernelix in Myanmar back in 2014. So primarily what we do is we provide the uh, cyber defense solutions and services to the organizations primarily in Myanmar. So what we mean by cyber defense is that uh, we help organizations find out a way to break into their networks and uh, help them uh, um, help them uh, strengthen the, their securities and provide detections and so-called response capabilities for the cyber attacks to mitigate the risk of uh, going on the digital platforms. So uh, when we talk about the cybersecurity or the cyber defense, we have we often see uh, two kinds of headline news. One is when uh, one once let's say uh, a crime syndicate or a group of hackers break into the bank and steal uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. So this kind of news we see is like uh, maybe once or twice a year in in on the mainstream media, but. And more often, what we see is this kind of news where organizations uh, uh, lost their data or that there was data breach due to the hacking incidents or some, some unfortunate incidents. So millions of, uh, hundreds of millions of personal information, financial records and the user information are being breached, mostly on a, probably on a weekly or monthly basis. So there's not, there's not a, a single month where big major organization has not lost their data or has not had a data breach incident in, in 2020 or past five years, as far as we could, uh, uh, we could uh, recall. So uh, when those uh, events are being analyzed over the statistics in the past, uh, let's say, 10 years, what the, the, the surveys or the, the research concludes that most of the threat actors, they, they Hack, hack the organizations, of course, for the, for the financial motive. So they want to steal some monies or some information from the organizations and then steal backs to make money. So some, there's some very major potion, minor portions, they break, they hack the net, networks and organizations for espionage where they, where a country or a corporation is trying to steal information from other countries or the corporations. Uh, another interesting fact about those studies is that most of our threat actors, most of the threat actors, about uh, almost 60% are run by the organized crime. So it's like a cyber mafia, it's a group of people trying to break into the networks and steal some funds and information. About 10% of us, the, the adversaries, the hackers are sponsored by the government, so-called what we call the nation states or state affiliated. So they were supported by the governments to do their hacking activity. So about 70% uh, of the, our adversaries falls into that category. What, what it means is that 
those threat actors, they have plans, they have determinations, and definitely they have sales skills. So imagine a group of uh, hackers with plans and determinations uh, trying to hack us. How, uh, how can we defend those, uh, those attacks? So uh, what, what, uh, until three, about three, four years ago, when we discussed about the cybersecurity and what I present to the cybersecurity, to the, the board members or the workshops, the seminars, this is where we could stop. We, we do not have much information about the local attacks, local incidents in the, in the market, but it has changed in the past couple of years. For instance, uh, two years ago, we started seeing uh, hackers targeting towards the banking users in the Myanmar to steal the username and password user using what we call the, the phishing technique. So they send uh, a fake emails to log into the systems and, and then they set up the fake login page to steal the user information and user ID and passwords. Another attacks we have seen uh, recently is the BC scan. So basically what it do is they hack into the email accounts or the email servers. And using that, those accounts and servers, they try to commit the financial fraud. So in 2018, in US alone, it cost the businesses $1.5 billion in that year. Uh, how they do is that uh, what, after they hacked into the, uh, the network, uh, the emails and the email accounts, uh, they sent a so-called uh, uh, email uh, posing as the suppliers and the service provider. And they told them that our usual bank account number has changed. So please send a, uh, please update your bank account numbers and send you this new account when you, when we, you make the payment for the, for let's say the monthly payments. So uh, the, our the unsuspecting uh, finance manager made payments to the new accounts. And maybe a couple of months later, when, uh, when the real uh, supplier, the vendor call up for the unpaid bills, that's when we discover that the payments uh, has been made to the fraudulent account. So uh, we run so-called what we call the cyber uh, digital forensics or the incident response services in Myanmar. So when there's been a hack or the cyber incidents, uh, we provide uh, digital forensic services to the, uh, to the organizations in Myanmar. So uh, in past couple of years, unfortunately, we have investigated about uh, almost uh, a dozens of cases over the past past couple of years. So uh, even though those numbers are not reported based on our, our experience and the industry, uh, industry gossips and uh, our, our experiences, the losses ranges from tens of thousands of dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars in Myanmar due to the BEC scam. So next, uh, when we jump into the uh, another so-called the more advanced attack, where what we call the state sponsors. In in 2020, we have observed those activities called what we call the Mustang Panther. So it's a group of hackers, China-based hackers, trying to steal information from the organizations in Asia Pacific. So we have seen these activities in Myanmar in, in 2020. So what those activities, what those malware or what those uh, uh, group does is that uh, first, they penetrate in, into the networks and copy all the uh, Excel files, Word documents, PowerPoint files, and the PDF files from our networks to send, send back to the server. So basically, they're stealing information from our network. So that has been observed since the early, early 2020 based on the, uh, based on the MM search, uh, advisory and also based on our incident response procedures. So recently, I think the most recent incidents we have observed is that uh, in the, during the election days, election uh, week, uh, the, the official government emails addresses were used to send the fake information to deserve the so-called propaganda. So um, based on those, uh, we could, uh, we could uh, see that the, there are a lot of threat actors activities in Myanmar especially in past, uh, past two years due to the, uh, the high mobile penetration rates and high, band, high uh, broadband users and uh, number of increasing number of digital services in the country. So how does this relate to the microfinance industries? Uh, based on the presentations I've observed earlier this uh, today, I think, I believe uh, we have about uh, 10 million borrowers 
in the market. So that means that we have a lot of personal information about those uh, those borrowers and their financial records. And also we have almost 60, uh, over 50 MFIs and their corporate information and their business information. So for those cyber criminals or threat actors, those are the opportunity for them to make money. So usually, even though if we, if we may not have way to steal fund from the MFI, we have a lot of personal information, know your customer, KYC information, most importantly, co consumer behaviors and their financial information. Those probably on the markets are usually uh, so-called what some some values to the threat actors. And most of the threat actors, they steal money, they steal, sorry, information and then sell those information to make money. So where do we uh, start our defense program? How do we defend ourselves from those, uh, those threat actors? Uh, before we jump into spending uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars or putting in the security team, first steps we need to identify is our assets. Where does our asset lies in? So I understand MFIs, if there's a different range of MFIs, probably with this very small ranging from a very small operations with a couple of uh, users to the large organizations with uh, spending across the country. So regardless of the size, we all use our emails. Some of us use Google, some of us use uh, Office 365, Google Workspace, or some uh, our own mail service. So this is the first, first assets that we need to secure. So we have a lot of sensitive confidential information in our email. Next, of course, we have uh, offices, even though uh, no, uh, doesn't matter how small, at least we have uh, offices where we keep our digital information on the laptops and the mobile devices offices. You know, some of us uh, have a data center where we uh, throw uh, stacks of uh, servers on our on our in our offices and together with a bunch of security products and the infrastructure products. Nowadays, the cloud is being very popular, like AWS, Azure, Office 365. A lot of our information lies on the clouds as well. Uh, Another aspect is that we have a lot of uh, digital services where we communicate with our uh, our customers or our our, our partners or mobile applications, web applications. Most importantly, uh, we have a bunch uh, our internal users and the customer. So after we identified our uh, assets and where our value is, then we can start considering about how to protect those those assets. So. Uh, a few years back, uh, until uh, 10 years ago, cybersecurity is practiced as a black magic where, uh, where no one knows what happens and how things are run. But uh, uh, recently, uh, thanks, to the, uh, thanks to the popularity of the disciplines, uh, we started to have a lot of process and the procedures to implement the security controls with, within our uh, environment. So, First, we consider about the people. How do we protect our people and how do we protect our customer? Next step, how can we streamline our process to protect those, uh, uh, mitigate the risk and of course, adopting the techno right technologies to prevent the threats. So most importantly, we need to obtain access to the security professionals. So that does not mean that we need to hire a bunch of uh, security professionals within our team. And as long as uh, we have uh, access to those professionals uh, within our reach in case of incidents or the consulting, probably uh, uh, some, some vendors at hand to uh, protect the, to uh, implement these security controls. Next is uh, raising awareness within our organizations to uh, about those cyber threats. For instance, if we receive this email, uh, well, our user click the link. For instance, I works in a, this uh, works. And if I receive this email, well, this employee from this uh, work will click the email. So it looks like it, it come from this uh, works tech support. Because we, from, for, for, for instance, user reads uh, from left to right. But uh, usually we should read our email address, address from right to left which means this is sent from the gmail.com, not this at works.com. So look, it looks like uh, anybody can sign up tech support at this at works.com and send this fake email. So if we see, receive those email, we'll 
our user be able to identify those uh, those attacks. So this kind of a awareness we need to raise within our organizations and to our customers. And also next step is the process. Do we have a process to respond to those cyber incidents or the response, uh, cyber incidents? For instance, uh, we are being hacked almost every day. Uh, we, we, right now we have about, uh, uh, about a dozen of uh, subscribers uh, for our security programs and we see attacks almost every day. So uh, what's important for us is that how do we respond to those attacks and how do we respond when the incidents happens? Who do we notify and how do we notify? And those are the processes that we need to establish. Another is securing our systems. We don't need to do much, just update the software regularly so that it's harder for the hackers to hack our system. Usually the hackers go for the low hanging fruits. They go for the easy targets. So if, we are, if our systems are secure and hard to hack, it's usually they, they will not, they will go for the other, other targets. For instance, uh, the previous email says so somebody sends a phishing email and steals a password and uh, steals our system. How do we prevent it? Quite simple, actually. Uh, we, we train our users to identify those kind of phishing emails. So this is one layer of defense. Next phase, just in case our email passwords were being stolen, we can go for, let's say, uh, two-factor authentications. On top of uh, passwords, the, the, the user need to use the, uh, the, the one-time passwords to log into the email address. And if we update our system security patch uh, regularly, it's very hard, to, hard for the hackers to hack our systems. And in case the system were compromised, if we have a monitoring response procedures in place, we can prevent those incidents from having, let's say, uh, uh, adverse impacts further. So uh, again, we can follow quite a number of security programs like ISO, uh, CIS, NIST, Cybersecurity Frameworks, or the PCI DSS. Depends on the organizations and industry, we can follow uh, what we call the security controls and frameworks to base, uh, base our uh, based our security programs. So usually uh, we can't, we should implement them face to face to face. Uh, based on our experience, I think uh, one of our, uh, my experience is that Myanmar, 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 us, uh, we are very impatient. So when we implement our security programs, we want to see the immediate results. It's uh, very hard. So what we do is we need to plan for a long term. Usually uh, three months plans, one year plan, three year, five year plans to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, enhance our security postures and defense capabilities within our organization. Uh, the number one important thing is to obtain the approval from the, uh, the management levels, then the rest can follow to uh, improve our security posture uh, along the way, can uh, one month, three months, one year, three year plans. So I think uh, I've overshot the time. So I'll uh, conclude my presentations here. And again, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Mr. Yedurathat, for sharing your valuable insights. 